Welcome to Simply the Word, the teaching ministry of Pastor Mike Butera and River City Calvary Chapel in Sacramento, California. The focus of our ministry is the verse-by-verse study of the Word of God. So sit back and take out your Bible as we look for God to speak to us simply through the Word. Poison! Woo! If you don't have a Bible, would you just raise your hand and we'll get you a Bible in your hands. We're in the book of 1 John today, finishing up uh, actually in the, the, at the end of the first chapter and into chapter 2 today. As we're looking at the reality, the reality of Jesus, the reality of our Christian faith, the reality of what fellowship is, the reality about the light of the world and what that means to walk in the light. I think that the first inkling in our, in, in, in our minds is, well, walking in the light means you, you, you don't sin anymore. You're walking in light. There's no sin. But that's not what it really actually means. Uh, God says here that even those who are in, in the light, that are walking in the light, are continually being washed from away from, uh, washed of sin uh, because of what Jesus has done. And so God's never expected us to be perfect, never expected us to ever get to the point this side of heaven, where we never sin again, but rather that we are walking in in the truth. We're walking in the reality of what God says in his word about ourselves, about who Jesus is and what he's doing. It's about about being open to what God's spirit is doing in our lives, humble before the word of God, seeking out a continual washing uh, through confession uh, in our fellowship with God, because if we know Jesus, we've been saved for all of eternity. And every sin on our account, past, present, and future, has been made white as wool, hasn't it? And so praise God, it's, a, it's about this relationship, being real in this relationship with God. And so some said, uh, I, I had them play that song. Yes, it was me, because I love that song. But it also had to do with poison, right? Poison. You know, when I was, one of the few remembrances I have of my dad who died when I was four um, was this hospital scene where I, I, I had ended up in the hospital and he was there with me, <laughs> giving me this thing called, uh, it was some kind of a mustard paste or something they used to give you back in the ancient days when I was a kid. And it made you just heave, you know, to get up something. You, you vomit, excuse me. Uh, but that's what you do. They get it up, you know. And so they give you this yucky stuff to eat. And I'm here, I'm four years old, and I'm ralphing it like crazy. But what got, got it was I drank poison. I didn't know. It looked like lemonade. All the other kids were there, the Boy Scouts, my brother's troop that was there in my backyard. And, and, and they had paint thinner. Uh, you know, back in those days, they didn't care about you know, whether it was oil paints or not, I guess, I don't know. They had a paint thinner out there, the caustic stuff. And I, you know, it kind of looked kind of like lemonade. And I just went and woofed it down, you know, and drank the lemonade and uh, boy, oh boy, was I sick. And I'm coughing, I'm choking, and I'm like, oh, oh, you know, I dare you, what did you do? And you know, my little old mom, she's watching at home. Hi, mom, Uh, be over there for some chicken soup tonight, okay? But my mom, you know, she, bless her heart, she didn't know what to do. And, you know, uh, my little mom picking up, well, I was only four years old, so I weighed only a couple hundred pounds. But, uh, no, but she actually got superhuman strength and picked me up from my ankles. And what do you do when you want to get poison out of your son? You tip him upside down and go like this, you know. And that didn't work. And so they made me take this yucky stuff down at the med center. It wasn't called that back then, but... It was where we went in the emergency, and it made me dress. You know what? I learned to hate to drink poison. I mean, a basic point. I experienced it. I had to take the medicine to get rid of it. I hated it. And it's going to be a talking about today that we need to learn to hate the poison. We need to learn to hate the poison. The poison is sin. It really and truly is. Someone said, your death warrant is, as it were, written on your own birth certificate. The Bible says all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God. Another man said sin is like a beard. Although we daily destroy its manifestations, it constantly reappears, doesn't it? 
Uh, some of us, a hair in the ears. I don't know, you know. Um, I'm starting to look like the fly up here, you know. When I take... Anyway, you get a little older, hair manifests, okay? You, you, you know, you have to do things about it that you wouldn't normally do. Um, let's go ahead and read. Stop this silliness. Oh, geez. Can't laugh in church. Forget that stuff. If we claim, verse 9, to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Now, remember, the context here is the church. The context here is the reality of the believer's life. This is not talking unto salvation forgiveness, but it's talking about our fellowship with God. We talked about that last week, that if you have a child, uh, they, as they disobey the rules of the house, as they do what dad, uh, don't do what daddy told them to do, or they do something that daddy told them not to do, until they come to daddy and cop to it and say, daddy, I'm sorry for what I did, there is a problem between us, and it has to do with fellowship. It doesn't have to do with relationship. She's still my daughter. I love her. She's, I'm still her dad. She loves me. But there's something wrong in our fellowship. I can't enjoy her until she gets things right and she agrees with me, her dad, about what she's done. That's what confess means, to agree with God. It has to do with coming into the light rather than staying in darkness. Coming into the light where God's light is a, that we allow it to reveal and to speak to us about what's in our hearts and what's going on and the truth of our reality and, and get it right, you know, being willing to look at ourselves. That's the light. And, and so he says, you know what? If we claim we have not sinned, verse 10, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. Remember, that was a problem at that time in the church, the Gnostic heresy. One of the, the manifestations of it was, hey, it doesn't matter what I do with my body. It's, the, the body is evil. And, and so it's only what matters is in the spirit. And so, you know, God knows what's in, the, in my spirit and, and he knows what's in my heart. And so even Jesus didn't, according to these guys, appear in the flesh, you know, and because and, the flesh is evil. And so party down, party hardy. You know, it doesn't matter what we do with our body. So let's just live uh, uh, as pagans and live in, in, in sin because it doesn't matter. God's not counting that against us. Well, of course, he's saying, if you say, if we claim we haven't sinned, uh, then we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. Now, here's the section we want to look at today. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. And so the, the idea of being saved from our sins, of being, uh, knowing our position in Christ that Paul taught so much about in the book of Ephesians and all throughout his writings, that in Christ Jesus, we have been made holy and blameless in the sight of God because of our position in Christ. Well, all of that good stuff is not so that we can think, all right, I got fire insurance, man. It doesn't matter what I do, man. It's just, hey, I've, got, I've figured out how to get over on God, you see. Just say the words. Raise your hand. Say the, the magic prayer. You get your fire insurance in Jesus, and then I can just go on and just live my life any way I want to live. And he says, no, the purpose is, is not for you to live in sin. I, I, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But listen, if anybody does sin... Any Christian that does sin, any believer that does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Our defense lawyer, not Johnny Cochran, Jesus Christ, okay? The righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And then check it out, Calvinists, people that are leading towards Reformation theology, bad theology, for not only ours did he die, but for the sins of the whole world world. Calvinism, I'm not going to get into a big thing on it, but Calvinism says that Jesus only died for those who God chose. He did not cho die for all of the world's sins. He only, the atonement is only meant for those whom God chose and those God didn't choose. Hey, they're just meant to go to hell. God chose them to go to hell and that's all there is to it. 
you have no choice. God is sovereign over everything. Watch out for that theology. It's getting very, very popular again. I don't know about you, but, you know, Julie and I, we live by the Ten Commandments in our home. We really do. We live by the Ten. I, I keep uh, about three of them. She keeps about seven of them. And together, we got all ten, man. Uh, you know, God doesn't want us to sin, does he? He doesn't want us to sin, but sin is inevitable. But we're never to be comfortable as Christians with sin. It should grieve us. It should grieve our spirit. Because we've been born again. The Bible, it, later on in, the, in this book, it's going to say, you know what? Because we've been born again, we cannot continue on in sin because the seed of God is in us. We cannot. You know, it's one of those things that we can't glory in how God has changed us. He's done that work in us, and he continues. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. And so what a glorious thing it is, man, that just to be really honestly grieved about sin is a good thing. I'm so gl glad I'm grieved about it because, uh, you know what, it would destroy me, in other words. It's poison, right? And it should inspire us when we sin. An attitude of determination should be inspired in us to overcome sin. That we don't want to continue in it, but we want to have power to, from God, from his Holy Spirit, to be able to not fall into sin again in that area. It should bring about a brokenness in our hearts, a humility before God. A humility before our brothers and sisters that, hey, but, but, for, but for the grace of God, there go I, you know. And, and it, there should be a repentance and a confession and an agreement, a desire to get right with God, a desire to get right with those whom we've sinned against. Because we've got to view sin as poison. And it's poisonous just like... Uh, uh, you know, I guess I hated the, the, the feeling of, of drinking that paint thinner. It burned. I don't remember all of it, but it must have really burned as it went down. It must have been painful. Uh, it's certainly what I do remember is that mustard stuff I had to, uh, made me want to, you know, puke it all up and everything. And so that taught me. I remember very, very faintly in my mind the first time I put my hand in the flame on the little gas stove that we had after mom had told me over and over and over again, that's hot, don't touch, hot. And I, but I had to experience it. When I did, I figured out, she's right. It's unpleasant to sin. And, and so to, to, to be in that place, we have to come into the reality. And that's going to be something that is our very good friend, a hatred of sin, a hatred of it. I remember when I came to know Christ, uh, here I was on my living room floor. I didn't know a Christian. I had read a book back in 1978 by Hal Lindsey, uh, who had uh, talked about prophecy and showed how the Bible is, is true, it's verifiable, it's, it, it, it's, and through the uh, prophecy, over 300 specific prophecies of Jesus Christ, uh, you know what, man, I came to the conclusion, man, it is true, the Bible is true, it is the word of God, and, and then the, the, I just had the four spiritual laws given to me in that book, and I was on my living room floor, professional musician, druggy, alcoholic, uh, every kind of sin and manifested in my life, living a life that was uh, uh, purely uh, not uh, pleasing to God or myself. And uh, you know what? I received Jesus Christ and something miraculous began to happen in my life from that very instant. I'll never forget, it's the goofiest thing. I had never given two thoughts to Jesus Christ, but every day from that time on, the first thing when I would wake up in the morning, I would just have this this thought in my life to, to say, I love you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know, and, and it would just be, end up being a smile on my face. It was like, weird. What am I thinking? Well, oh yeah, I, I, I gave my life to the Lord. That's right. You know, and the reality of Jesus in my life began to manifest. And, and you know what? Here I am, uh, you know, fa famous for all the Don Rickles cut jokes. I had them all memorized back then. And, and all of the filth and all of the things that I would say with my mouth, you know, just to try to be cool, you know. And, and, and I, so here I'm talking with my friends or we're at rehearsal or, uh, with the band or whatever. And, I, and we start going off and start chattering. And I let out what I would normally let out, and it just, like, tasted like that mustard, you know? Made me, oh, I wish, I, ew, that, did, that, that did not give me the effect that it used to give me. It wasn't a pleasure, it was a disgrace. It, it wasn't fun, it, it, it was 
it was it was hurtful in my heart. It, it just something had changed, man. He had changed what I like, and, and, and he started to to give me things that I liked that I that I began to hate. And it was not something that some preacher told me. Ah, oh, you know, you're going to hell if you talk that way. No, it was the spirit of God in my life, and and I was born again. I was no longer who I once was, and God was changing me. Sound familiar? Because that's it, man. It's a relationship, isn't it? And, and, and so it's a beautiful thing as, as, as to get free from sin, to live, uh, not that we'll ever be perfect, but to live as, as John wrote, I, 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 I pray that you won't sin anymore. But if you do sin, here's the remedy. But I pray that you won't sin. How do we get into that place where, where the poison of sin is not affecting us and in in manifesting in a continuous manner anymore? in our lives. Well, there's some things that has to, be, has to be accomplished. And the first thing is we've got to view it as poison. And the way that we view it is that we, we need to understand what it is, the reality, the reality. Now, listen, I want you to turn over to Genesis chapter 39. Keep both sides open. You're going to be there in Genesis for a little while. Those of you that are new to the Bible, Genesis is really easy to find. It's the first book in the Bible, and it's chapter 36. <clears throat> And it's that story of Joseph with Potter. And, and this is just this little section where uh, Joseph is um, being tempted into sin by Potiphar's wife. I would imagine she was probably a pretty nice looking lady, pretty attractive. Uh, I know Joseph was, it says, it says so in the Bible. Uh, it says he was well-built and handsome. Um, if, if, you can't figure, if you can't put that in your mind, look up here at me. And <laughs> What are you laughing at? Jeez, Paul, who are these people, man? No respect. Okay. <laughs> well, look what it says in verse 1 of chapter 39. I said 1, didn't I? Yeah, let's go 1. Chapter 39, verse 1. Let's get the whole thing in here. Now, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, Potiphar, an Egyptian, who was one of uh, Pharaoh's officials. Can you turn this mic up a little bit? The captain of the guard brought him from the, uh, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. And the Lord was with Joseph and he prospered. And he lived in the house of his, his Egyptian master. And when his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything that he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. And Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything that he owned. And from the time that he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. And the blessing of the Lord was on everything that Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. And so he left in Joseph's care everything that he had. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself about with anything except the food that he ate. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master doesn't concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns has been entrusted to me. No one greater in this house than uh, I am. Uh, there is no one greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though he spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. Guys, for us to learn to hate the poison of sin, we must view our sin in the reality of those that we will hurt. Those who have, we have placed our trust, that have placed their trust in us, that have looked up to us. Andrea and I, Andrea and I were just talking about that, that uh, today, how with the people that we looked up to and, and how they're falling uh, in our, is, a, is something that's tragic to see people that we once thought of highly and that, that God used in our life and to see them not progressing or to be hung up in their lives in some way. And, and so to hate that, notice what he, uh, to hate it, we must, re, we must realize who we're going to hurt. And, and that's exactly what, what he did. He says, notice what he says. He says, but with me, uh, with me in charge, he told her, my master doesn't concern himself with anything. Look at the privilege that's been given to me. Everything he owns has been in my care. 
He says, my master has withheld nothing from me, verse 9, except you, his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? And so he, he realized the privilege that he had. He realized, how could I do this against my master? And, and uh, you know, that's one of the things we need to hate is those people uh, that, that would be uh, stumbled over our sin if they were to witness our falling and, and to see how people might say, oh, yeah, that guy, he's a hypocrite. I never want anything to do with this Jesus stuff because I saw a guy. He lived across the street from me, and I used to see he's a drunk. I used to see him doing terrible things. I used to see him screaming and yelling at his wife. Oh, who wants that? And, and they'll, they'll use you as an excuse not to come to Christ. What an awful nightmare that would be to have that to be true of ourselves. And, and so to, we need to learn uh, to... to hate the poison of sin because by those that we stumble, those who we might hurt that looked up to us. Think about your children, uh, parents. How, what, are they, what are you displaying? I know you want them to go to church and you tell them what, to do what Jesus would do and, and, and you have rules. Do you live by those rules or are you a hypocrite? Do you uh, live for Jesus just as you're having them or, you, or what do they see in your life? What do they see when you come home from church? They see one set of language skills at church and then they see another whole set of language skills at home. What are they seeing? You should, that should make you sick of the poison of sin. How you might be stumbling them and possibly doing that in their lives. Look what he said in verse 9, the second part. He said, how then can I do such a wicked thing? Oh, guys, how can I do such a wicked thing? We must view it as a contradiction. To hate our sin, we must view it as a contradiction to who we are. A contradiction. How can I do that? It's not that we think that we're better than anybody, but we know that we've been given the grace of God. We've been given the privilege of knowing God. How can I do such a wicked thing? Remember in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, it says, Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? And then he says, Don't be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And then he says this, That's what some of you were. I could look at a couple little places to tick off on that list and say that's what I was. That's what some of you were, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God, of our God. And so he says, you know, hey, it's a contradiction, man, to who I am. How can I do such a wicked thing? For me to continue in sin is a contradiction to who I am, and I hate the poison of sin. I've been a, I'm a child of God. I've been born again into a new life. I'm a new creation. The old is gone. It's in the past and the new has come. I've been washed by that precious blood of Jesus. I've been purchased by God and I'm no longer my own. I'm forgiven. I've been made blameless. And I've been justified just as if I'd never sinned. I'm loved of God. I'm an heir of Christ. Man, I hate sin. I've got to come into that reality. That's not who I am. Another one of those things, and, and look, at, look at verse 9 again. Uh, what, what did he say there? He says, how could I then do such a what? Wicked thing. We, to hate the poison of sin, we must view it as it is, a wicked thing. Sin is a wicked thing. Don't rationalize it away. It's dangerous to take a light view of sin. It's dangerous as we see the gray it in shades of gray rather than black and white. As we do that, we start to justify our sinful actions, our sinful attitudes. What ends up happening is that it, it, it comes, it, it desensitizes us. It's like uh, taking penicillin into your body and then you don't take the whole prescription of it and you just take it for a couple days and then you stop for a month and then you take another couple days and then you stop another month. What ends up happening, it has no more effect. And that is the way that our hearts can get hardened. They, they, get, they get used to the sin because we've compromised and we've allowed that and rationalized that sin. I find that 
that can happen and it has happened in the past in, in, in many marriage relationships, you know, rather than being in the light about our differences and saying, you know, uh, you know, maybe what my spouse has been saying to me is, is true. I mean, you know, rather than that, you know, we, we go into this mode, well, I, that's not going to win me points. And how am I going to, I got to dominate, you know, and I, and I can't give into this because even if it's true, you know, because uh, then, it'll, you know, it'll be all hell to pay, you know, we won't have to, won't have that uh, dominant relationship where I win, you know, and, and so it goes on and it gets buried and it becomes a cancer in the marriage and it goes on and on and on and on because we won't simply won't look at it. We justify it because after all, he's such a jerk or she's such a jerk or whatever. And, 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 and so it's a terrible thing, uh, you know, uh, and, and it ends up being something that, uh, you know, uh, it, it just it just compromises in our life and spreads in our life like cancer. Guys, to hate the poison of sin, we not we need to stop making excuses. Remember when God asked uh, Adam about his sin, who did Adam blame? His wife. And he goes to his wife Eve, and who did she blame? She blamed the devil, you know. And and so usually those are the way the way that we deal with things. How easy it is to excuse our sins by blaming somebody, somebody else. Well, this person and that person, you know, they did this to me. Oh, that, that justifies what you're doing. That justifies your uh, heart. Uh, well, yeah, well, they, you know, when they come and say they're sorry to me, then I'll come and say that I'm sorry to them. Oh, oh, okay, that justifies it. That's what Jesus taught, didn't he? Right. And so we can be in that place. And, and, and it's, man, God knows the truth and he'll hold you responsible for it. And until you do, man, it's like you're eating the mustard, dude. You're eating the mustard. You're, you're just sick in your life. And, and you've got to admit your wrong attitudes. You've got to admit the actions. You've got to ask God for forgiveness. And don't try to get away with sin by blaming somebody else. To hate sin like it's a poison, we need to also stop walking in darkness. Stop walking. Look at, look, flip. Uh, hold your place again because you're coming back to Genesis. Go over to 1 John 1.7. 1 John 1.7. He, he, what is that phrase over and over again? Walking in the light or walk in the light. Verse 7 of chapter 1. The secret to victory over sin is found in that very phrase. We need to stop walking in darkness and choose to walk in the light. Look at verse 7 there. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Did you see what it just said there? When you're walking in darkness, your sin, still there, still being manifest, not nearly as much. It's not a, a habitual pattern, but you're still going to sin. Walking in the light does not mean that you're never going to sin again. Walking in the light means that, that you're going to sin a lot less, that's for sure. But you're, as you're opening your, light, uh, your heart to the truth, as you're looking at things as God looks at them in your life, you're not hiding behind facades or phoniness or excuses. You're, you're not compromising your life. You're open to what God has to say in your life. Guess what? You're not going to sin very much. But when you do sin, you know what? Praise God. Uh, we have that, that purification that comes through confession, uh, as we've learned in, in chapter, or verse 8 and, and 9. And so it means to be open and honest, guys. If we want to hate the poison of sin, start walking in the light. How do you do that? One of the reasons, one of the things today, as in every day, we just open up the Bible. And, and uh, you know, as, as terrible as I am at preaching and terrible as my voice is and unskilled as it is, uh, or maybe it's some guy like uh, some of these guys that are just great teachers, great orators, whatever it may be. I love David Jeremiah. I just love that guy, the way he preaches. But it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. It's the Spirit of God. It's his word. As you're open before his word. And the word is read, and it, and it has this wonderful habit of convicting us, uh, of saying, here, okay, here, I'm going to turn on the flashlight, and, and we have something blocking it. You know, we're kind of saying, no, don't, don't get the light out, until we say, okay, I'm willing to let the light of the word come in. And it opens up, and it comes into our heart, and it shows us some things. It shows us. We have to have that kind of attitude that, you know what? Let the light come in. I want to walk in the light. But if you're not doing that, if you're not acknowledging, 
God's word and you're just walking away from it, as James said, you're like a man who sees himself in a mirror and then walks away and forgets what he looks like. Oh man, you're missing out on a great opportunity to grow. And you're in darkness. That's what you're walking in. You're walking in darkness. Hate it. To hate that, you've got to come into the light of God's word and his fellowship. You know, there was a, back in the, the Roman days, uh, there was, uh, you know, the sculptors uh, that would be in the marketplace and they would make these figurines of, you know, could be the emperors or it could have been the pagans, you know, it could be false gods. I don't know. It could be women or whatever they would do. You'd have them in your garden and stuff around your house. And uh, this, this type of limestone, this kind of, uh, of uh, stone that they would use, sometimes, you know, you just kind of get a little herky-jerky when you're, you know, you're, you're going with a hammer and you're hitting it and, you, oh, you know, and you knock off a nose or an ear or something, you know, and you got this guy like this, you know. What are you going to do? You spend all these days on, on this thing and now he doesn't have a nose. Well, you know, the, the, the guys that were rip-offs in those days would take wax and they would bring it, melt it down so it was just, you know, kind of uh, workable. And they would take it and they would stick it on the nose and they would make a nose uh, out of wax. And, and you couldn't tell uh, at first in the marketplace, you know, they keep it in the shade, of course. You couldn't tell that this, this uh, was made out of wax. Well, the people would pay the money and they would take it home and set it in the sun in their garden. And, and they come out a couple hours later and here's the nose all, you know, running down and there's no more nose. And so what they would, so people would get upset about that. And so the merchants began, the honest merchants would always have a sign and it would say, Sin Sarah, which means without wax. That is the root word of the word in the scripture that says, and Paul prayed that his friends in Philippians 1.10 might be sincere and without offense. Offense. Sincere. That's where we get the word sincere. Without wax. I wonder how many of us have a phony nose this morning. I wonder how many of us are ears or wax, both of them, not just one, both. Some of us got a, a wax smile on our face. Ah, oh, yeah, everything's cool in my life, man. I'm all oh, right on. Praise the Lord. Woo! Glory to God. Glory to God. And we just say all the spiritual language and come on, but our lives are a wreck. It's, it's with wax. It, there's, it's full of wax. It's, it's false. It's phony. God says, get into the light. That's how I can work in your life. Be sincere without wax. Sincere in your lives. And it's, it's unfortunate how many people that come to churches are just covered in wax. It's sad. It's them that has drunk that poison of insincerity towards the word of God. And they're walking in darkness. Well, look, to hate the poison of sin, we also need to understand also that, uh, look what it says there uh, in verse 9. It's still, I think we're back at, uh, let's see. Yeah. Oh, I think it's back in... in uh, um, Genesis. Is it John, Genesis 9, verse 9? Uh, does it say, <laughs> I didn't write the scripture down here. I'm sorry. Uh, but, but to hate sin, we need to understand that it grieves God. He says, how can I do this horrible sin against God? You see, how can I do such a thing against God? And, and, and it, that's where, who it is. Sin is against God. It, 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 thank God it causes guilt. God has built into us a, a, uh, you know, this, this portion of our, of our hearts in our lives that, 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 is, that is very, very sensitive to being wrong with God. There, it, it, that's where the guilt complex comes from. And, and there, there is that, that essence within us that guilty feelings will come as we try to hide from God. And, and the worst step that you can take is to, to try to eliminate the guilty feelings. I'm convinced that's why we have so many people completely crazy walking around our streets. It's not just the drug influence. A lot of it is, it's just not being able to get, uh, deal with sin, to deal with sin, to get rid of it, to be forgiven or to forgive others. And it's just killed their, their minds and everything in their bodies and everything. And, and, and it's like, you know, uh, when we, 
are convicted because we've wronged God. We're guilty before God because of what we've done. We can try to, uh, you know, just take a pain reliever, you know, instead of deal, dealing with the essence of the wound, we're taking a pain reliever just to get us out of the moment. And that pain reliever can be just drinking. It can be drugging. It can be partying. It can be all kinds of different things. Going and buying something. Going to Macy's, open up a new account. You know, they'll give you one real quick. And go buy something that's overpriced about three times. And go over there, you you know, but you get credit, easy credit, and go over there and get it, and you feel better for a little while, but it doesn't last long because you're still guilty. And then you got to do it again and again and again and again. And, and, and that's, a, that, that's one of those things we've got to understand about our sin. We've got to hate the poison of sin because it grieves God's heart. We've got to come to that conclusion that it creates a barrier between us and God. David, remember, as he, as he sinned, and now, remember, he sinned against Bathsheba, and in that action, he sinned against Uriah. He, he, he really caused him to be killed. It was like second-degree murder. And then all of the people that, that knew him and the king, being the king, and they looked up to him, he let down all of his people. He sinned about, about so, against a whole bunch of people. But you know what he said when he confessed with Nathan? He says, Lord, against you uh, and you only have I sinned, he said that. Because in his heart, that was, it was so much, it was so much greater, his sin before God than, than towards any other human being. He was, he was broken before God. And it's a great place to be, be broken before God, continually broken. Oh, guys, you know, so far we've talked about how our hatred of sin should manifest itself in our minds, right? How we view things. But there's also some actions that need to be taken. Look at Genesis 39, 10. Look what Joseph did. He took some specific physical actions. Notice what he did. He stopped. He, he did not flirt with temptation. Look at verse 39. He said, he refused to go to bed with her. Well, good boy. But, or even be with her. Or even be with her. That's what I want to, sh to show you. Yes, he didn't, he, he didn't commit fornication with her, but he, he wouldn't even be around her. Uh, Joseph was one of the most godly men we see in the scriptures. What a wonderful believer. But, but even he, I mean, I, I think of how strong Joseph is here in, in, in all of his life, the integrity of his life. You'd, 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 you'd almost think, well, Joseph, you didn't really need to do that because you know, you're a strong guy, you know, you're not going to fall. Oh no. And even him as, as godly as he was, he would not even be around her because he knew that he could be influenced. He could be tempted just like anybody else. Look also. And so what was that point? The point was don't flirt with temptation. Don't flirt with it. Uh, girls, girls, I'm going to tell you at work, you know, uh, you go through th times in your life and, and uh, maybe there's something, you know, in your marriage that, that needs to be handled by God and, and there needs to be some renewing in your heart and your husband's heart. But watch out at work if you're work a working woman. Uh, these men that give you attention or these men that, you know, want to talk to you or, and, and you know what, you, uh, you, you know, you know, oh, no, no, I, you know, I would never go out and have a drink with him. You know, uh, you know, I would never want to ever uh, do that for my, to my husband. I would never sin like that against God. But, but you're kind of tickled about it, that he, that he thinks you're attractive. You're kind of tickled that, he, that you're so important. Oh, and, he, and then all of a sudden you're opening your heart to that. And oh, look how tender and sensitive he is. Oh, he's not like that beast I live with. Uh, oh, you know. Oh, and, and you know, well, just a little lunch. That won't hurt, a little lunch. And then you start to open your heart and talk to him about your emotions and your troubles and all of that. And all of a sudden you've committed a spiritual adultery in your hearts. And, and, and it's really, really hard for you gals to break away from somebody. And it's going to get physical after that. Hey, don't flirt around with it, with temptation. Don't flirt around with it. You know, temptation, uh, you know, in, in, in especially the first, the first uh, parts of sin usually feels pretty good, kind of fun. Then it becomes not so fun and it becomes something that you have to do. And finally, it, it just becomes bondage completely, no matter what it is. Look what it says in verse, uh, chapter 39, verse 11 and, and 12 over there. And look, look what he did do. He ran, didn't he? He ran. She came after him and she, and she grabs hold of his robe and uh, he took off and he left his robe in her hands. He, you know, he, there was, she must have had quite a grip, I tell you. He just said, no way, you're holding on to me, babe. I'll go and get out of here, you know. 
he, he really, I mean, that tells you there was a struggle there, you know? And uh, uh, guys, is, uh, to, to flee from sin, to, to, to not go to those places that perhaps are, are tempting us. Now, we, now, really, we can't, we can't pull back from the entire world, uh, of course, you know? And there are some things where you just can't withdraw, but, but there may be some, some places that, you know, going to old haunts or hanging out with, with the same people, uh, that, that, that cause you to sin is something that God is calling you to, to get away from it. Run away. Run away from sin because it, it is poison. And then I think also we need to, in Romans 12 too, it says renewing by, in other words, uh, you know, there's a thing called renewing your minds, you know, that, that don't, don't allow your mind to be captured by the worldly way of thinking, but renew your minds. He's talking about renewing it in, in the word, renewing it in fellowship, renewing it in prayer, renewing it in praise. All of these things that we do, we need to renew our minds by the word of God. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. We need to replace bad company with good fellowship. People that, that love God, people that are going to encourage you in Christ, people who are going to pray for you. Replace those, those, that bad company with those. The Bible says to be, uh, do not be drunk with wine or, or loaded on pot or, or are high on meth or whatever it may be, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. I used to say it this way and it sounded really cool back in the day. Now it sounds corny. People would try to say, hey, you want to get high? I'm high on Jesus, man. Mm. Poison Ivy. That was cool. Cool. <laughs> but that's what it is. I'm high on Jesus, man. The Holy Spirit. Oh, man. That's what God said. Don't be drunk. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, when those temptations come to drink or they come, temptations come, first of all, look at what's the problem here? What, what is coming to the light? Lord, show me what the issue is. Why am I wanting this? Why am I being gravitating towards this behavior again? Lord, what is it in my life? And there's usually something, maybe it's depression, maybe it's, it's anxieties, maybe it's, it, it, and you go down what it is, and, and it ends up being something with, a, with somebody else, a, a relationship, an area of sin or conflict that you're not dealing with the way Jesus told you to deal with it. And, it, and, and that's what's causing the depression. That's what's causing the, the, the anxiety. And as you come back with the word of God and you say, you know what, go to that brother whom you have, who has sinned against you or whether you've sinned against them and get things right. And you'll see that God will, will, will take away that anxiety, take away that depression, and, and, and therefore that, that desire to go to those things and to deal with life through a bottle or whatever it may be. We need to replace our bad habits with good habits. Uh, and, and that's, you know, I talked about bad company. I talked about uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit and, and, and selfishness, those, you know, serving our desires, being focused on what we want and what we can accumulate in this life. How about serving others? How about getting involved in a ministry in this church? It's amazing, a, a, a body that this size, that we are still scrounging for teachers constantly. Can we just get somebody who loves kids to come in there and just, just with whatever you have that God gives you just to bless these kids that Jesus loves. And so many of the parents in this church, sorry, please don't get mad at me, but get mad at me if you want. It's the truth. So many parents in this church don't have any ministry in this church. And we're taking care of your kids and we love it. We don't want it to stop, but you know what? You should be involved. Shame on you. Shame on you. Sorry. We're looking for people to clean up this church all the time. We got plenty of people dirtying it. No problem there. We don't need any more. Oh, it's all filled up. Just, just go home. No, no. But we need some people to help us clean it. Well, I don't have time because I'm doing my thing and I'm me, me, I, ooh, I ooh, you know. And what is it? You don't have time for, to serve God in your life because you're self-focused. Oh, boy, I could go on with that one. I better not. I will get somebody mad at me. Our bondage to our thought in our thought life, uh, whether it be anger, or whether it be lust or bitterness. 
as we go to God in prayer and confess it, as we do battle in our thought life, as God, the scriptures declare, Proverbs 23, 7, for as he thinks in his heart, so he is. There's a truth, a very big truth in that as we continue to allow thoughts in our mind. You see, because I can't stop a thought entering my mind. Satan can do that. He can speak in my mind. He can't read my mind, but he can say something to me. That, you, know, he, uh, uh, you know, my flesh can think of all kinds of things my, when I dream and all that kind of stuff. I can't stop what comes into my mind, quite honest. God can certainly speak. I cannot stop what goes into my mind, but I can make a choice of what I will dwell on. And that is a choice that I can make. What am I going to continue to think about? And every a evil action begins with an evil thought, guys. And that, that mind, the mind is a battleground of, of probably the greatest war that man has ever, ever seen. And we have a choice on what we're going to think about and what we're going to ponder in our hearts. And 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, We demolish arguments in every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. He's talking about the battlefield of what our thought life. Look what he says. We demolish. That's warfare, man. Bazooka. <laughs> we demolish arguments that come into our mind. And every pretension that sets itself up against what? The truth. What is the truth? Against the knowledge of God, you see, that he has told us. And we take captive, just as you take a prisoner captive, we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. That's warfare, man. Warfare of our thought life. Oh, that word demolishes. Kathiro um, means to destroy or to refute those thoughts that are in rebellion to God's word. We resist and we destroy it with the word of God. We take captive that to capture the thought and retake our minds from that invading enemy. And we make it obedient to Christ as we give that thought. I, I just do it just for what it says right there. I just say, Jesus, here's this thought. I'm, I, I give it to you. I, 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 I think cowboy days, howdy doody and all that stuff with the, you know, ah, phew, Lasso him in. Okay, Jesus, he's yours. <laughs> and uh, that's how my thought life goes. Maybe you guys are more into Star Wars. You can uh, get him with one of those laser uh, things. But, but whatever it is, you know, you make it obedient to Christ. Create in me a clean heart, God says. Oh, God, and renew a right spirit in me. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And, and so it is, guys, in our, in our hearts, guys. If we need, to, we need to hate sin, guys, we need to hate it. And to hate it, we're going to have to view it uh, as poison in our, in our lives. We've got to view it for what it is. And then we've got to take action in our lives and make some changes uh, in our lives. What about you? Where are you today? Does this speak to you? Well, then do something about it. Quit, quit allowing it to continue on. Because what is the, where is the, the whole thing? What is the whole action of sin? It is what the devil wants to do. He is out to steal, kill, destroy. And if you are here this morning and God has convicted you about some things, some areas, he's, he's put his light out and it's wide open in your life. If you walk away without getting this thing right, then you have opened the door for Satan to kill, steal, and destroy. You're saying, walk right in, do it. And so, Lord, we just thank you today. We thank you for your word. We thank you that it humbles us and shows us. Lord, it's good to be in the light of your word. It's good, Lord. It's painful sometimes. It's embarrassing sometimes, I guess, to our pride, to our ego. Lord, it shows us Sometimes in a bad light. I mean, every one of us, Lord. It shows us how weak we are, how dependent we are on you, how needy we are for you. But Lord, that's the reality. We need you. But Lord, you've called us to stand up and be strong. You've told us to, to have a proper attitude towards our sin this morning to view it as poison, and to start hating the poison. 
Stop ingesting it. And there's some things that we just need to do, Lord. We need to walk in your light and view things the way you view them. And so we need to start thinking about things, Lord, and viewing things the way you view them rather than the way our flesh views them. And we really realize, Lord, that there are those that are looking up to us as, as, as a model of Christianity, whether we want it or not, they are. We don't want to let them down. Lord, we, we, we need to view that, that it's a contradiction to ourselves. It's not who you've made us to be. Lord, we need to look at it as, as a wicked thing. It really is wicked. It's not something that we've you know, crafted it into being. It, it's a wicked thing. And that it's something that, Lord, we, we, we've maybe covered with excuses so much. But now, Lord, we come into the light over these things. Oh, Lord, we realize that it's, it's going to make some choices in, in, in our lives, some choices to change, some choices to flee sin, to, to not give in to it, to change some, make some changes in our fellowship and the things that we do, Lord, that cause us uh, to be in that place of temptation. Oh, Lord, help us as believers. And I want to just say to you that his eyes are bowed, eyes are bowed, yeah, and, and uh, heads are closed. <laughs> uh, you know, if you've, you know, what beautiful thing is, we've talked a lot about sin, but you know what the, the, the issue is for us? That this is because in this life, we have to deal with it still. But the, the reality for all of us that are believers is that God has, has taken it completely away in view of heaven. If we, any one of us that have been born again here were to, were to die right at this moment, we actually, God has told us we can know that we're going to be saved. We can know that we're going to heaven because sin is no longer a barrier between us and God. It's a barrier in this life and that we want to, to be more like God and sin has its repercussions in our lives and we want to be, live godly lives, but it's not a, a view unto salvation. We're not trying to be Mr. Goody Two Shoes to get into heaven, but, but we realize because we are going to heaven, we want to please God. How about you? Have you met Jesus Christ? Have you come into fellowship with him? Have, have you gotten to know him just like I did in my, back in the day on my living room floor, just in no big religious uh, kind of environment, but I just asked Jesus Christ to come in and save me and, and, and take over my life. Have you done, made that step really in your hearts? And, and there was an attitude in my heart that said, you know what, Lord, I'm finished trying to run it myself. Uh, Lord, I, I want you to, to rule over me and I want you to be in my life. And I trust you for what you did. You died on the cross for me. Is there any here that might just, while eyes are closed and heads are bowed, would just raise their hands and just say, yeah, that's me, Pastor. I, I want to pray with you right now. And I want to say a little prayer. Is that you? Would just raise your hand and say, you know, I want to receive Jesus Christ this morning. I want, to, I want to be made right before God. I want him to wipe out all of my sins and forgive me of all of that. Is there any here that would just raise their hand and say, I'm, I'm with you, Pastor Mike. I want to pray along with you. Well, I thank you, Lord, for all these Christians here. So, Lord, uh, we're going to go after that. And so maybe today is a time of confession for you. Indeed, it says before we take communion that we are to make sure that we are right, examine our hearts before we take communion. Doesn't mean to be condemned because if we will just agree with God, he says, we, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us with all unrighteousness. So as we just spend a little time, quiet time, we're going to sing a song. We're going to pass out the emblems here, uh, uh, the, the bread and the wine. And we're going to pass that out. Would you hold on to that? And would you just, uh, just ask God, show me, Lord, is there anything I need? Thanks for listening to Simply the Word. We would love to be a further blessing to you. You can visit our website at www.rivercitycc.com. There you can take advantage of a treasure chest of biblical resources to assist you in your service to God. Are you new in your faith? Take our intensive online Bible discipleship class called Foundations of the Faith and grow in your walk in Christ. There you can also join our email list and receive devotions by Pastor Mike, share prayer requests, and ask questions. Our website is www.rivercitycc.com. Again, that's www.rivercitycc.com. And thank you again for listening to Simply the Word.